Hello everyone, um, I'm Elise Brogan, most of you know that and will have been here before, but for anyone who's new, um, I am the Education Lead for the New to Practice Fellowship um, and today we are very lucky to have with us Dr Natalia Kennedy who's coming to speak to us about how to be a green practice. Please do promote New to Practice if you do know anyone who would like to join, you know, get them in touch with us, we'd be more than happy for, for more and more people to join us. Um, and um, I do always try and update the WhatsApp group with education sessions that I know about and with the sessions for today just to give reminders out so if you would like to join the WhatsApp group just send me a message you can send it to me securely on the Zoom today or you can email me and I'm more than happy to join you to the WhatsApp group I really don't send many messages because I hate being pinged a million times with WhatsApp but hopefully I just send you the, the useful ones Finally, um, we will, as always, send out the feedback form for today. I genuinely read all the feedback and I jot things down and every, all the sessions that people are suggesting, I've got them in my list and um, Gail and I are meeting soon to try and plan the next kind of six, 12 months. So if you've got anything that you think we should change or that you think we should do, then we'll definitely um, read all that. So please, please do fill those in. The top, top two are pictures in, in Derbyshire somewhere. Um, does anyone want to hazard a guess as to where the top left is? Is that one near Castleton? Yep. Yeah. So that is exactly right. That's Hope Cement Works in the uh, Hope Valley near Castleton. It's probably the most photographed cement works in the country because why would you photograph a cement works? Um, and does anyone know what the top right is? It's one of the reservoirs, but I can't remember which one. It is spot on. So that is the bottom <laughs> Lady Bar Reservoir. Um, well done to the two guys who got the, um, the the locations earlier. If we're doing this in person, you would have um, Maltesers or chocolatey rewards. So if you get yourself some of those for later, um, I obviously can't give you any from here. So sorry, but well done. Um, the idea behind the pictures in this presentation is just to get you excited about living in Derbyshire and also appreciate the greenery and to make sure you're all still awake. Um, so I was going to start with asking, does anyone know where this is? Probably the most popular spot in the Derby side of the Peak District. Dovedale. That is, that's Dovedale. It's the stepping stones at the bottom and Thought Cloud at the top. Um, and the only same thing I'd say, if you're going up Thought Cloud, don't, don't underestimate it. Um, and where shoes that aren't flip-flops because mountain rescue end up pulling a lot of people off the top of there with hurty ankles. Um, so the idea behind Greener Practice is there is a growing concern amongst particularly the younger generation but in general in the world that uh, climate change is having a, a massive impact. Um, there's a lot of conversations about it there's a lot of greenwashing, so people saying they're doing things to be green and to look green, but actually they're not making a massive difference at all. Um, and so the idea behind this presentation is to give you a bit of a framework to think about it, to give you a bit of an idea of why I think it's important, to have an idea of what might make the biggest difference. So in terms of order of magnitude, if you could change one thing, what are the things to be concentrating on? Um, have a bit of a think about what might practically be possible because we're all busy and we've all got a lot of stuff to think about anyway and the last thing you need is people kind of hitting you with a big stick to be better people it's not the idea of this at all it's just a bit of an idea of, of, of the options out there and where you can get some help if, if you did want to do some stuff um, and then I'll kind of talk about some examples that um, Polly and I experienced, so Polly was one of the other NTP fellows at my practice, um, who's over in Chester now, um, and she and I tried to do some stuff in the practice, and we got some things right, and some things went hilariously, um, not wrong, but they didn't really get much take up, so kind of trying to share our experience a bit um, for humour and also hopefully for, for usefulness for you guys. Um, so uh, who am I to be talking about this? Um, fairly unqualified to be honest. My, my dad's a green counsellor, my friend's a climate scientist. I am just a GP. I've been qualified for a couple of years now. I did the need to practice scheme um, when I first qualified. Um, and I just like being outdoors. I'm interested in 
keeping the planet nice and encouraging everyone else to enjoy playing outside as well. So that's kind of where, where I'm coming to this from. Um, so why is it important? Um, as I say, there's been a lot of conversation about this in recent years, and actually um, the WHO came up with um, this statement the other year, which is obviously fairly significant, that climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. Um, that's quite punchy. Um, when you break that down, there's a lot of different elements to that. What we're going to be looking at today particularly is carbon footprint and how we can reduce our carbon footprint. The idea being that carbon footprint is a, a way of measuring greenhouse gas emission contributions. Greenhouse gases um, effectively heat up the atmosphere, contribute to global warming. Global warming is bad for the planet um, in the variety of ways that hopefully you can see from the slide. It's not the greatest of resolution because it is a screenshot from the, the WHO website. Um, in terms of how climate change affects um, health, it basically affects the social and environmental determinants of health. So clean air, safe drinking water, sufficient food, secure shelter. Luckily, a lot of those we've actually managed to achieve in this country and in the UK in general over the past 50, 60 years of the NHS. But the fact that they're coming into threat um, from climate change in the rest of the world and potentially those things will have an impact on us and we'll sort of go through that in a bit. Um, I think we just need to be aware for and, and start planning for. Um, so globally, between 20, 2030 and 2050, climate change is expected to cause approximately 250,000 additional deaths per year. And those are mainly from things like malnutrition, malaria, diarrhea, so diseases that you see in in places that where the health infrastructure is more vulnerable and the population is more vulnerable to these kind of issues anyway. Um, but in the UK, we're not immune from increasingly frequent weather, weather events. So this was a slide we were stuck on earlier. Um, the idea behind the picture of the Hope Valley Cement Works is it's just having to think about clean air in this country, you know, and you only need to look at the case um, from just outside uh, or just inside the London Ring Road where the coroner reversed the um, uh, the previous death certificate and added um, poor air quality onto the, the death certificate for was it a nine year old child with asthma to realise that actually this is, this is a growing concern. Um, obviously, you've got clean air zones coming in, in in quite a lot of the big cities, so Bristol, Bradford. Sheffield's just introduced one um, and it is something that we I think has a bigger impact than we realise and as we start to tackle it we might see some considerable improvements with um, so on a report that I'll go into a bit later they reckon if we can improve the clean air issue that we have at the moment um, you can save about um, nearly 6,000 lives a year so that's sort of clean air, which is a, a current and um, significant issue in the UK now. Um, the photo top right is is the, the the Lady Bower Reservoir, and I think that's that's the remains of Derwent Village. It might be Asherton. It's quite hard to tell. Um, that was actually taken in in 2018 when the reservoirs dried up, um, but we've had. Um, about uh, 900 excess deaths from the heat wave in 2019. Um, I think most of you can remember last summer and the, the chaos that the heat waves caused with, with, you know, even the radio stations giving out fairly basic health advice. Um, and certainly in Sheffield and the Northern General, they closed the theatres for a couple of days because patients were coming out with temperatures of 38 degrees, which is um, suboptimal. So I think we're, we're starting to see the effect of, of sort of increasing weather events. Um, obviously, there's, there's things like floods in, in Cumbria and particularly down in the south west. Um, again, in Derbyshire, we're not as badly affected and um, that you can kind of see as it's starting to have an impact across the country. It, it will start to impact on us. Um, the photo sort of bottom right is, is me in my slightly precarious COVID, homemade COVID PPE that we had at the first start of the pandemic in, in GP land. 
and I'm sure you can all remember that we all started off wearing our own glasses and then gradually added on kind of homemade visors and then and these aprons that were hilariously ineffectual. Um, the point of that being that as temperatures rise across the world, we will get increasing um, uh, infections, so zoonotic infections, as people start sort of impinging on areas that are currently wild animal habitats, engaging more with, with wild animals because their normal food supplies are running out or they're looking for more wood or they're looking for water. The effect of those zoonoses are now no longer localised. We live in a global, um, increasingly globalised world. And so if someone eats a fruit bat in the Democratic Republic of Congo, it is entirely possible that they will give us um, a viral hemorrhagic fever that starts killing people in the UK, you know, a couple of weeks later. Um, I think COVID is a fairly good um, example of that, an example of how we need to start thinking globally about healthcare because we, selfishness doesn't work um, from this point of view. Um, the picture bottom left is just a, a generic screenshot, um, thinking about the cost of living and that, we've all seen that significantly worsen um, as a direct consequence of some political decisions and also the war in Ukraine. Um, I guess that's just reiterating a point that we live in a, a, a world where the, the supply chain is, is globalised. Um, issues and wars in one part of the world have a direct impact on, on us and on our patients in this country. And I'm sure that you guys are seeing as many people as, as I am who are you know, really struggling with, with fuel poverty and with the mental health consequences of that and turning to GPs for support because they don't know where else to turn. Um, and although the war in Ukraine is not about water, it's not about food shortages, those wars will increasingly happen unless we do something about climate change. Um, the other thing that the, the NHS sort of report picked up was that um, greener practice, the promotion of things like active travel, locally sourced food, more conscious um, awareness of what diets we're eating, potentially lower meat, lower fat diets, um, could have a massive impact in terms of the, the, the chronic health conditions that people in the UK suffer. And when they were writing their kind of um, NHS climate management report, they reckon that by tackling active travel and diets can reduce obesity and save about 38,000 lives a year and improve the myriad of conditions that go with poor diet, including, you know, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, heart condition strokes, um, all that kind of stuff and save about 100,000 lives a year. Now, I don't have the breakdown of those figures, but certainly the, the, the methodology and the people involved do seem pretty credible. Um, so I think, I guess what I'm saying is overall, yes, it's a global, global problem. Yes, those people in developing countries stand to suffer first, but there are some pretty immediate consequences for us. And there's certainly some pretty severe future consequences for us unless we do something about that. Um, so, ooh, someone's waiting in the waiting room. Elise, are you able to admit the person who's waiting or does that, do I have to do that? Um, if you make me co-host, I can, but um, I've got Amy's going to join us, um, admin support in a, in a hopefully five, ten minutes. Um, but yeah, until that, you are all powerful, Natalia. That's terrifying. Really <laughs> Sorry. Really I'm just going to see if I can, what happens is when I share my screen, I can't see where my mouse is. Yeah. So it's all a, I get yeah. things that go a bit greyer, um, which is, so I might end up stopping share. That poor person has gone away somewhere. Sorry. Um, right, let's, let's carry on. Uh, no, I can't carry on. Right, there we go. So, um, in terms of thinking about climate change, obviously there's an impact on healthcare, on health and therefore on healthcare of climate change. So let's think about as healthcare workers, what is our contribution to the problem? Um, 
does anyone have an idea of scale roughly where the NHS sits versus air travel in this country? I think the NHS will come out worse, probably. Mm -hmm. um, so air travel, I think, um, although we travel a lot by air travel, the number of people globally travelling by air is still relatively small, is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Any Any advances on that, thoughts, discussion? So interestingly, I don't have the figures for global air travel. Um, and I think you could well be right. Certainly from, from a point of view of air travel in the UK, and this is pre-COVID air travel, so probably the levels we're just about creeping up to now, rather than how we've been in the past couple of years, the NHS is actually slightly better. So it's about 4% of carbon, carbon emissions, um, sorry, in England, not in the UK. And air travel is about 5.9%. Um, so we're only, just below which gives you a sense of the kind of the order of magnitude of the problem we're dealing with here um so all of this seems very 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 gloomy um and if anyone could tell me where that is um you're a better person than i can because i just googled dark skies over derbyshire and that's what came up um it might be over all at all in the middle there but i'm not convinced the good news is there are some chinks of light through the cloud. Um, and in fact, overall, the picture is gradually improving from an NHS point of view. So in England, the health and social care system reduced its carbon footprint by about 62% between 1990 and 2020. Now you could argue that <laughs> the size of the health and social care system was also fairly drastically reduced during that time. Um, but I think there have been concerted efforts happening already. And I think what we're hoping for now in terms of a, a countrywide perspective is to try and increase and accelerate that trend if possible. Um, the other thing that we did manage to do was reduce our water footprint by about 21% um, from 2010 to 2017. Again, with this talk, I'm kind of focusing on carbon emissions because it's it's the thing that we've got the most evidence for. It's the most clear cut. It's the easiest thing I can find in terms of practical tips for you guys to do things. Um, but don't forget that, that being greener is not just about carbon emissions. It's also about water consumption and, and, and sustainable sourcing of various things as well, um, resources in particular. So the legislation behind all of this um, Basically, there was a sustainable development unit set up in 2008. They were kind of doing some good work in the background. Not that many people were listening to them, as far as I can tell. Suddenly, the spotlight shone on COP26 in Glasgow, and everyone sat up and started taking notice. And it was signed into the Health and Care Act in 2020 um, that we were going to embed net zero into legislation and make it a statutory, statutory guidance for all the NHS health trusts. So regardless of whether or not you're aware of it, all of the trusts have had guidance that they should be following about how to reduce their carbon footprint. And most of them will be doing it to a greater or lesser extent. And um, the target they've set is to reduce direct carbon emissions to zero by 2040 and indirect carbon emissions that the NHS are capable of influencing by 2045. That does seem quite ambitious to me. I like ambitious because then if we fall short, we're probably still a lot better than we would have been had we set really easily obtainable targets. But all that feels quite daunting when you're just one person sitting in your practice room thinking, yes, OK, but what does that mean for my day to day? Um, so. I think it's helpful to have a bit of a framework to think about where we can make the most difference and what areas we should be tackling. So again, apologies for the, the quality of this picture. This is a screen grab from the uh, SDU's, NHS SDU's report. Um, that basically shows the percentage contributions to um, carbon footprint. Um, and you, you can kind of see um, personal travel is a reasonable chunk. Um, medicines, medical equipment, supply chain stuff is, is huge. Um, 
in terms of kind of climate jargon, what they'll talk about is scope one emissions, which is the things that you directly produce. So, for example, if you're an anaesthetist using anaesthetic gases, those are your scope one emissions. Scope two are things that are sort of directly necessary, but you're not producing. So things like we need to use electricity, the, supply, the, the suppliers of electricity are, are producing carbon emissions on our behalf. So that's kind of scope two. Scope three is sort of indirectly necessary. We don't have as much control over it. So supply chain, staff transport, that kind of thing. I've got to be honest, for, for our purposes, I don't find that that useful. Um, in pragmatic terms, I tend to find it more useful thinking about clinical care. So how do we practice clinically and what changes can we make there? Prast uh, sorry, practice logistics. So um, things like electrical usage, building heating, recycling possibilities, um, and then individual stuff. So what can you as an individual do if you want to? Um, I think the key take home message from the, the, the talk is, you know, don't, don't beat yourself up for not achieving impossible standards. Anything you do is, is going to help. Um, and if you have an increased consciousness of the issues, you're more likely to make choices that are helpful overall. And that will then set an example to other people. Um, and also that there's a lot of help available out there. So a lot of people have, have done some good work that I'm going to just piggyback on the back of. So um, it's a bit about picking our battles because we're busy people and we only have a certain amount of excess headspace to um, focus on this particular issue, if any at all. What is the biggest contributor to our carbon footprint? in general practice what's the battle that if we could pick to fight and win would make the biggest difference overall um, medication particularly inhalers and inhalers as a sort of single entity are the, the single biggest issue so i will spend quite a lot of time focusing on that um, in a second um, just to make sure everyone's awake does anyone know where this picture is or what it is that Thor's cave. It is. It's the inside of Thor's cave, looking down um, and out into the, the sort of the Dovedale Valley. Um, everyone comes in the right hand entrance. Pro tip, go back out the right hand entrance um, because the number of people who go out the little window on the left and then get stuck um, is astonishing. So Mountain Rescue goes there quite a lot as well. Um, so these are the battles we're picking. Again, sorry for the, the, the quality of the, the screen gap grab. Um, if you look across, you can see kind of primary care on the, the upright, and you'll see that you guys are basically 100% right. So meter dose inhalers in particular are the biggest single thing for primary care. Um, but then if you go down one, you can see medicines and chemicals as a whole in general is pretty huge as well so that sorry just look at this this is ordered in the kind of the the scope one two three um so that's sort of the directly possible then looking at the kind of the supply chain so where it says medicines medical equipment that kind of thing it's incorporating all the the producing and the supply and the packaging and everything like that of medications as well as um the medications themselves and the, the prescriptions of them um non-medical equipment business services um which includes sort of basically all the all the running of the practice type governs and then patient visitor travel is the, the the biggest one on on the bottom tier so um full points all round um inhalers so if the nhs is contributing about four percent of the carbon footprint in england MDIs contribute nearly 4% of the entire NHS carbon footprint um, and about a quarter of the general practice prescribing carbon footprint. So they, they are huge. And if you can pick a, a single battle to pick, um, this, is, this is the one to choose. Um, there is a really, really good 20 minute presentation on the Red Whale update site. And I have no financial affiliations to them whatsoever. Um, 
but if you have access or you know someone who has access who can show it to you without um, incurring some kind of horrible legal thing. I, I would have played it to you on this um, if I could have done because I think it's great. But it's looking at asthma and particularly inhaler prescribing and what we can do to make it better. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to spend a little bit of time. I've sort of shamelessly um, jumped on, on some of their ideas because um, they laid it out quite nicely in terms of ways of thinking about it. So they, they talk about the six Ds. So option number one is disease prevention. So things like stopping people smoking, stopping parents from smoking, um, managing air pollution obviously isn't something that's within things that we can control, but hopefully local authorities are, are, are helping with that. Um, but if we can cut down the number of people particularly struggling with things like asthma, COPD. Obviously, we have fewer um, pneumoconioses these days, thanks to the mines being shutting down, but there's always some kind of occupational lung disease going on, in particularly in the kind of the, the north central parts of Derbyshire. And anything we can do to minimise those will help the number of inhalers that we end up having to prescribe, as well as obviously helping our patients. Um, diagnosis that's about getting the right diagnosis so does this person actually have asthma or is there chronic cough due to post nasal drip um uh, gourd um other things and they their friend has an inhaler and they want an inhaler and they ask for an inhaler every year but no one's actually confirmed that they do have asthma so the the kind of the take home there is if you think they've got asthma and they tick all the boxes for an asthma diagnosis, trial of treatment, 200 micrograms of beclomethadone, six weeks, if they're not getting better, take the inhaler off them and have a think about what else it could be um, to make sure that the people with the diagnosis have the diagnosis. Similarly, the kids who have viral induced wheeze and get an inhaler every year and are 12 and are still getting an inhaler every year, but don't actually have a diagnosis of asthma. Um, trying to just have a little look at them and making sure they're not just you know using it to treatments not working then we shouldn't be prescribing this treatment um disease control there's a lot of different elements to that um essentially poor disease control leads to a massive rocket in, in carbon footprint not just from an increased use of, of sabers um but also if their disease control is poor and they end up with hospital admissions then you're looking at a massive skyrocketing carbon um, emissions as a result of a hospital admission and everything that hospitals entail. So checking people have a decent understanding of their condition, what their triggers are, um, how they can manage it to sort of stop themselves from having exacerbations or jump on the exacerbations early, particularly if it's asthma or COPD. Um, technique making sure that they're taking their inhalers properly so they are getting the, the full impact of the medication they're taking personalized action plans and just making sure that they actually know what they mean and what to do with them um smoking cessation obviously if, if at all possible and i realize it's sometimes a tough battle to pick um and then sort of medication reviews um including potentially thinking about increasing um, their maintenance control rather than relying on uh, the short acting beta agonists, which are the worst in terms of the propellants. Um, so when you're when you're looking at inhalers, not all inhalers are equally bad. So the kind of the pressurized meter dose inhalers, so your classic blue salbutamol that's in the picture, is the worst of the worst. Of those, some are worse than others. So ventolin inhalers, Symbicor and Flutiform are the three big baddies of the kind of the badness. Um, one of those will have the same carbon footprint or as an average person on an average day. So if you think if you've got someone using two inhalers a month, they are massively increasing their carbon footprint. If when you're looking at the device, which is kind of when it comes into the inhalers, which is the next, the fourth D. Dry powder inhalers don't contain the propellant, which is the gas part that is the, the bad part in terms of the, the greenhouse gas that has the impact um, and, and sort of creates the carbon emissions. Um, 
so they are much much better you can also get soft mist inhalers which to be honest i don't have any personal experience of um but i'm sure the respiratory nurses could, could tell you a bit more when we're looking at sort of trying to persuade people to switch or to try a different device it's a question of having a conversation because if the person is not happy with their device doesn't know how to use it can't use it won't use it then you're going back to they're going to have poor control you're going to have an admission carbon footprint gets worse so the idea with devices is, is have the conversation ideally it would be an opt-out not an opt-in conversation so medication reviews asthma reviews on a yearly basis copd reviews for example would, would be a good place to start having that conversation um but obviously pick your patients the ones who will need a pressurized meter dose inhaler are kids under 12 um because the the dry powder inhalers aren't licensed for for kids under 12 um the people who can't take a kind of a quick deep breath in to activate the the dry powder inhaler so say you need to be able to take a breath in over sort of two to three seconds rather than the long slow four to five second breath of a a, a meter dose inhaler um and so people with severe disease potentially wouldn't have that kind of ability to be able to get on with a, a dry powder inhaler um some people might have manual dexterity problems coordination problems cognitive issues that means that they can't manage a new or different inhaler um people who are really unwell and find that they can't when they're unwell but can when they're well you don't want to be prescribing them two inhalers so just go with a, the meter dose one um similarly people who have very brittle asthma quite poor control as a, as a baseline you probably don't want to be switching their management if they're only just hanging on with with what they've got um and as i said at the beginning people who just don't want to swap, switch and so won't use a new inhaler um in terms of kind of having that conversation um it doesn't necessarily need to be you guys who have the conversation it doesn't necessarily need to be a climate change conversation because most of our patients well a reasonable proportion of our patients won't have that as the kind of the top of their their priorities when they're coming in for their asthma or copd review but it's a the evidence is that for the vast majority of people the control is just as good the cost is significantly less um, in terms of, you know, potentially saving the best part of 10 million a year for the NHS if we can switch um, 10 to 25 percent of people off the meter dose inhalers onto the, the dry powder inhalers. Um, and and there's a lot of people do get on better with them once they've got their heads around how to use it and, and when to use it. The other thing worth thinking about with the the um, device side of things is that you can get um, sort of the, the smart regimes um, so they just have one inhaler for using for maintenance and also um, um, a reliever um, and so sometimes it can make it a little bit easier for people to just have one device they know how to use it um, and obviously that's great in terms of the number of inhalers a year that you're, you're prescribing for them make sure that they are actually getting every dose of their inhaler so films in hollywood will always have people testing their inhaler by spraying it into the air that's an absolute nightmare because that's a dose that isn't going into the lungs where it's needed um if they're using a pressurized meter dose inhaler um make sure they're using a spacer with it so it is actually distributed in the air goes down into the lungs and isn't spraying the back of the throat um and then have a think about if someone's using two puffs of 100 micrograms back the methadone a day could they potentially have one puff of a 200 microgram inhaler so you've got the kind of because it's the the propellant side that is an issue every squirt that you can save is a, a save from a carbon footprint point of view so if you can change someone from having two puffs a day to one puff a day but for the same dose, you're effectively halving the carbon footprint of, of what they're taking from an inhaler point of view. Um, and then the, the sixth D is disposal. Now, we used to have some options for actually recycling inhalers. 
Um, unfortunately, those aren't available at the moment, um, and the, the 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 ones that were in Derbyshire have, have certainly stopped. Um, I think there is a trial in Leicestershire at the moment um, that they they're trying to kind of recycle the both the the gases side of things and the the plastic um of the inhalers themselves um hopefully that will become available to us in in the next couple of years um and the place to find out about that would be the the greener practice website that i'll come on to a bit later in the talk um but there's, there's nothing available in terms of full-on recycling at the moment but the worst case scenario is that inhalers end up in household landfill so someone fin finishes their inhaler chucks it in the bin off they go and it goes to landfill um, because the, the propellant gases um, there will still be some left and they will then go into the atmosphere unchanged and that's when they're the most potent so um, inhaler gases refrigerant gases are the other ones that we might may have sort of leaching out from landfill and, and causing chaos um, so the best option is at the moment is for them to take it back to the pharmacy. What the pharmacies in, in Derbyshire will do at the moment is send them for incineration. And although it sounds awful to burn them, um, burning the gases actually makes them slightly less potent from a carbon emissions point of view. So it's, it's better than landfill. Hey, Natalia, do you know the, um, the equivalent salbutamol? Is it, is it easy, easy halo? What's, can you, do you remember what the name is of the one that's been tried? Ah, so sorry, sorry, you, sorry, you, sorry, sorry, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, <laughs> system, this is system one, um, and I've got to be honest, I don't know what Emis has, and I don't know if Arden's works on system one, but this is the Arden's template that you can get on system one, and they've made life ridiculously easy for us um, in terms of when you click on respiratory, asthma formulary, or um, COPD, I think this is asthma, looking at it, um, they will have listed um, cost and also carbon cost. Um, so you've got your, your lower environmental impact inhalers at the top there. Interestingly, yeah, Ventolin is, is very much worse from an environmental point of view than the, the Salomol inhaler. Um, and we had, we did a bit of a, an audit on this as part of our greener practice. And we had seven patients who specifically wanted Ventolin brand inhalers um, and they actually would not be shifted from that. Um, everyone else had already been shifted onto the generic Salomon inhaler and of those a reasonable number at our kind of asthma reviews were able to be shifted onto dry powder inhalers. Some of them subsequently went back because they didn't feel it, it, it worked for them but actually the vast majority that had that conversation and, and switched have stayed switched, which was, was quite nice. But I, I just found it really interesting that the, the Ventolin guys were very specifically, it has to be Ventolin, Ventolin works for me, nothing else does. Um, in terms of kind of when you're doing your reviews, the, the people to look at, sort of rough rule of thumb for people to look at, optimizing their control and maybe increasing the maintenance therapy, are people who are using more than uh, three uh, short acting inhalers a year, so they're requiring more than three in a, in a calendar year, um, or people who are asking for fewer than um, three of their maintenance inhalers a year, because those are the people who are likely to need more maintenance or potentially are, aren't using their maintenance properly because um, then they forget to take it or they're not using it often enough and relying more on their, their, their blue inhaler. Um, so that's it's just useful to have little hooks when you're looking at sort of med reviews and that kind of thing it can be really hard to work out but over three of the the short acting or under three of your maintenance have a think about is there anything we can do to, to optimize this person um natalie just to say um oliver's popped in the chat he's written in emis has a prompt that tells you what the low carbon version is before you prescribe yeah, yeah that's good. thank you that's that's really helpful because i yeah i don't know emis at all but it's cool that they have that um and i think with with the one of the things that i think will come through with the legislation that was signed in july is that increasingly those prompts will be there and it will be easier for us to make that decision to have the information um because otherwise you, you have to go looking for it which is is obviously not something we have time to do on a normal consultation uh still on the sort of the the clinical care side of, of um, carbon footprint 
uh, contributions. Um, someone mentioned earlier that sort of medication and prescribing was a, was a big part of it, um, and that's certainly the case. Um, and I guess the, the sort of the, the subtitle is, is de-prescribing, because actually the fewer medications we can prescribe, the better for the environment because the fewer that have to be manufactured, the less packaging, transport costs, all that kind of thing. I guess the caveat is we need to ensure that we're keeping people well because sick people end up in hospital and that's worse for, for emissions. Um, so that there is always that balance. Um, in terms of kind of things to think about that will sort of minimise hopefully medication use, but maximise patient care. Um, it's, it's a case of sort of having that, that conversation with the patient. And I appreciate that, that 10 minute consultation times are not great for having that chat about, well, I know you came in for some diazepam, but actually, if you could start Couch to 5K and make a few extra friends by going to a knitting group and change your diet, you might find that you get your endorphins from elsewhere and relax more. And, and sort of all the stuff that we, the diet and lifestyle stuff that we, we know helps, but maybe don't always have time to communicate to our patients. Um, there's quite a lot of work being done at the moment with sort of health coaching um, and certainly um, in our PCM we've well I'd, I'd be interested actually at least do you do you have health and wellbeing coaches at Crouch as well? Yes we do yeah we've had um, a wellbeing person that we can book patients in with yeah and they found it really good. So that's that's been really helpful for us in terms of this sort of non-medical intervention it's not IAPT necessary it's someone who could have better diabetic control if they improve the diet, could have better liver function tests if they reduce their alcohol, even though they're not a problem drinker needing to talk to Derbyshire Recovery Partnership, you know, could, could do with losing a bit of weight and the, the general metabolic syndrome would, would have better outcomes. But they're not quite sure where to start and you don't have 20 minutes to half an hour going through the lifestyle with them and going, well, you could tweak that, you can maybe think about doing this what do you think would make a difference and then kind of teasing it out to them and supporting them to make those changes and that's where the, the health and well, well, well-being coaches have, have been absolutely gold dust for us. I think the thing I'd say from a, a GP perspective is that I did find it very useful to go on a, a two-day health coaching course because some of the questioning and some of the techniques is quite useful for working out whether someone's open to that conversation or not because if they're not open to that conversation it's not worth having if they are open then that's someone you could potentially signpost to a health and wellbeing coach for example and avoid the need for medication whatsoever not everything can be treated without medication we're lucky we've got a lot of good meds that do a lot of good things and um, so for people who are on medications and need medications how do we optimize those so I think regular and regular med reviews, so annual med reviews, um, and being pretty thorough about them. So we used to have ad hoc med reviews. Someone's meds would come to the end of their their sort of um, range. They'd been uh, issued a couple of times past the the issue restrictions. They'd been reauthorised once and then issued twice again. And then someone will go, oh, we need to review these. And they'd add it on to um, the end of a busy GP list for a one minute phone call or um, potentially some some poor um, registrar. What we've done is, is, is change things a bit. So we now have a medication review system that happens in the, per in the patient's birthday month. We try and tell them to expect it so they can anticipate it and bring all their questions then. And we try and take the time that it takes to go through those. Um, so polypharmacy in particular, um, sort of making sure we go through each of those meds and say, do, do you really need them? Is there any way we could sort of wean down that one or increase the dose of this in order to get things, things working a bit better for you and maybe stop a couple of things? Um, and that has made quite a big difference both to the admin that we have to do in terms of script queries on a daily basis, but also in terms of the number of medications that patients get but don't necessarily need or 
are taking but could potentially not take. Um, I think compliance checks are pretty big on that. So we all know patients who go, well, yes, I'm prescribed this, but I don't really take it. Um, we've all done home visits where people have kind of bags of meds stacked up at the door. Um, and, and so looking at, are they actually taking it? Do they know why they're taking it? Are they happy to take it? Are there any barriers to them taking it if they need it? And also, you know, the idea of medication amnesty. So look, you've got all these meds piled up. I know that you don't want to stop your prescriptions because you're worried about, you know, not having your meds, but do you maybe want to take these ones back to the pharmacy? Um, and if they're in sort of full, full boxes and full packets or, or untampered with, they might be able to do some stuff with that. Compliance aid are, are an interesting one. So obviously dosset, dosset boxes, um, you know, are potential for additional packaging, but if they stop people from taking the wrong meds and getting ill, or if they stop um, people from stockpiling meds or not being sure about what meds they're taking or taking meds that they don't need to take, they can actually be really, really useful. So from a kind of uh, an order of magnitude perspective, a little bit of plastic and cardboard in the dosser box versus the potential emissions from, from someone taking the wrong medications, too much, too little stockpiling, um, that getting unwell and being admitted to hospital. Um, Dosser boxes is definitely the one I'd pick. Um, there was a pilot scheme in Derbyshire for, for, for green social prescribing. I don't actually have any information on that, so I'd be really interested if anyone's been involved in that. The, the idea is that you increase access to green spaces, um, particularly post-COVID, because it helps with the kind of the mental health um, struggles that the sort of the minor mental health struggles that people have, have had. I think that's possibly been accessed more by the social prescribers um, locally, but that was something that that Darvish has been a pilot for in the past couple of years. Um, and I just I don't have any information about that. So I thought it was interesting, but I'm, I'm a bit in the dark. Yeah, just on that point, I don't have any information particularly, but I mean, anecdotally, I think things that are promoted by general practice, re regardless of what we read in the paper and the, um, particularly the Telegraph seems to have got it in for us at the moment, publishing lists of practices and how many appointments they have. We are still trusted and respected. So like I say, it's anecdotal, but when my practice started uh, a walking group and equally a couch to 5K group, people felt very safe to come and join those. Um, we had to look very carefully at, you know, do we need any indemnity for doing these kind of things that are over and above the normal? But people feel safe and it kind of underlines the importance of physical activity. We, um, our Couch to 5K thing was pre-pandemic and a couple of our nurses were going to start doing it and they said is it okay if we invite, you know, put an invite out to patients. So we thought well yeah nobody will take up the offer. I think week two they've got about a trail of 70 people running past Tesco, so fantastic, you know, things to think about. And I, th I think that's a really lovely example of if you have a thought or an idea, run with it because it might well capture something in someone else. It sets a bit of an example. It may work and have that. I mean, that's a phenomenal kind of impact. Um, it may not, but it, if you're thinking it, it's probably worth a try. Um, certainly in terms of, of trusted professions, you're absolutely right. We, we've dropped a little bit from where we were pre-pandemic, interestingly, but um, on the latest survey, I, I saw 85% of still, people would still trust um, what a doctor told them. Tr sorry, trust the doctor to tell them the truth. And 89% of people would trust nurses. So if in doubt, get the nurses to tell them. So um, more on clinical care, um, just think about um, responsible referrals. So GPs do um, an awful lot of uh, 
gatekeeping, for want of a better word. Um, in terms of kind of carbon emissions for hospital appointments, there's obviously transport and travel for patients to hospitals. Um, diagnostic tests in themselves have, have a, a carbon um, footprint attached to them. Procedures certainly do, especially if they involve anaesthetic gases. Sustainable Development Unit, the SDU. Um, commission services, so the things that we um, commission make up about so over 63% of the carbon footprint in primary care. Um, so it's a case of sort of having that conversation with people and saying, look, you've had X number of full blood counts over the past year. I know you're worried about having anemia, but you really don't have anemia. You know, look at this trend. I know that your mum had thyroid issues, but you've had a thyroid test every every year for the past, you know, 17 years. You've had these symptoms for that time. You know, you, you had a, another check last month. I don't think we need to repeat it at this point in time. Um, you know, someone's having a, a dementia a memory assessment service um, referral. Just having a quick look back and instead of taking on the ice thing that says memory screening lot, just go back and go, well, look, they, they had an FBC last month. They've had LFTs, U's and E's, um, you know, uh, HbA1c. Actually, I just need to do a calcium thyroid and hematinics and and sort of add them on. So trying to avoid duplication, I think having that honest conversation with patients as to what is going to change or what's going to be achieved by a referral. So, um, you know, you, the conversation that we have for the benefit of patient care anyway, so you're 98 year old with multiple chronic issues who can it's bed bound really probably doesn't actually want to go into the hospital for a colonoscopy do we make the referral and they get sent in for a ct scan but then wouldn't want an operation wouldn't be fit for an operation not being afraid to have those conversations about what are we looking to get out of the referral and what do we want to achieve before we send them for a referral and that i think on a personal note, I found that more difficult kind of working remotely because someone's telling you something on the phone. It's much easier to say, well, go and get the tests and we'll review you with the tests. And then you're reassured by a normal ultrasound, normal bloods, whatever it is. And you can then stand up and go, no, nope, I was right in, you know, my clinical uh, diagnosis. This is how we're going to manage, you know, this is this. These are our options for management. Um, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I think for the, the past couple of years, um, certainly in our practice, we've noticed our numbers of sort of um, uh, blood test imagery referrals, that kind of thing, going up a little bit as we've done more remote consultation. And they're starting to come down more as we do more and more face to face, because if you can see someone face to face, you can go, actually, you know, from your point of view and your reassurance, you don't need the extra level of, well, we'll just check this, we'll just check that. And I know that's the case, but I need to reassure myself. And also from the patient point of view, they feel like they've been seen and examined by the doctor. They do more or less still trust us. And if we're saying we're not worried about this or this wouldn't help in this situation, they would actually listen to that. Um, there's a resource that the Greener Practice website um, suggests uh, help is, is helpful with this, which is called Choosing Wisely. I've had a look at it and it's it's reasonably I think it's it's set up for the American market where obviously there, there is potential for a lot of excess imaging and duplication of stuff because it's it's all um, insurance based. I think on the NHS we're actually relatively good and as GPs I think we're probably exceptionally good at making these judgments and being pretty um, responsible with our referrals. Um, but I guess it's just having it in the back of your mind and certainly it's it's a, a helpful kind of nudge for me in my practice um, if it's sitting there in the back of my head do I actually need to repeat this person's ultrasound um, I don't know if people have had experience of kind of being pressurised into doing referrals or finding that they're doing more with remote consulting or, and I I think on that, if if you have the time, 
trying to work out why the person wants what they feel they want. Is it because they're scared that we're missing something? In which case I have sometimes gone back through their notes and gone, you have had this, 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 this. You've been seen by X number of GPs. Um, and kind of walk them through it and say that, you know, there is, this has not been missed. If, you know, if you had this, it would have shown of this. If you had that, it would have shown. So trying to find out where, where that question is coming from. Is it that they have a sense that they, they're coming in assuming that they're going to be fogged off? Is it that they feel like they haven't been listened to? Um, in which case, those are all things that you might potentially be able to tackle. And they, they probably won't be able to tell you why they really want what they want. But my sense is that their agenda will have a motivation for it. And if you can, maybe over the course of a number of consultations, find out what that is and tackle that, you, you might win. I mean, you, you can't win them all. Um, and certainly we in our practice, we've, we've started, uh, we're going to do a dictation trial to see if that makes no keeping easier. Um, I think the choosing website, sorry, choosing wisely website does have some patient information sheets um, that you can print off and give them to go away and read. And then sort of for the, the commonly requested, not necessarily necessary things. And then potentially you could go, look, I'm not sure we need to do this at the moment. Here's some information. Go away and read that and I'll call you in next week or come back in a couple of weeks and we'll revisit it. Um, and that that might be a way to do it, but I yeah, it's a tricky one. I think as well some aspects of motivation or interviewing techniques. Um, it's this is probably a bit of a plug for a video we'll put on the site in a week or two. Is a conversation I had with Steph Barron, who's a GP up at New Bolt Surgery, but. Steph's particular interest is in motivation and interviewing and I learned quite a lot of tips and and suggestions from a, a conversation we had yesterday with herself and some of my other GP task force fellows so once we've edited that we'll put it on the the website and, and there might be things in there that you think oh that's that's a different way of approaching this conversation Anyway, so practice contributions. Uh, energy use is obviously a big one. Um, so reduce usage as much as possible. So things like LED light bulbs. Obviously for a lot of us, um, well basically unless you're a partner, you're probably not gonna have much influence into the running and the management decisions of the practice. Um, but if you make suggestions and your partners are happy to listen, um, some of these things are, are pretty straightforward. So, you know, your, your LED light bulbs are, are a classic win. Um, heating in terms of kind of um, when the heating's on, when it's off, whether or not you're all having to sit there with like radiators blaring, but your windows open to kind of improve air circulation during, during winter and potential COVID times. Um, it's all a bit of a, a a balancing act in terms of sort of cl clinical stuff and and um, and practicalities. Um, obviously, you, you can't run a practice by just switching the heating off and having your people shivering in the waiting area. Um, I certainly found that my consultations got a lot quicker if I turned down the radiator in my room because people wouldn't kind of come in and take off their coat and hang it up. And then, you know, four minutes later, they're still sitting down and they come in and they kind of wrap their coat around them a little bit warmer. And then unless I needed to examine them, they'd, they'd, they'd be ready to go. Um, Fittings and fixtures usage, um, that's probably something that you might be able to do a little bit more. And um, even if it's just things like when you're boiling a kettle for tea, um, just fill it up for the amount of water that you need. Or obviously, if there's someone else coming in, do it for both of you so you don't look like an antisocial so and so. Um, but not necessarily filling a full kettle and boiling a full kettle every time. Um, those pre-boiled water urns are a complete nightmare for energy usage. They just, just chew through it. Um, so avoid those if possible. Um, and and sort of IT, obviously the NHS got, got hit a few years ago because no one left their um, systems on overnight to upgrade. But again, just, just realising that actually if something's on standby rather than switched off, it's still using energy. So if you just switch, unless they're upgrading the, the software, 
or updating the software, sorry, to switch the computers off properly at the end of the day and then restart them the next day if you can um, will make quite a big difference sort of trickle feed over the year for, for energy consumption. Um, in terms of the waste produced by the practice, that's an, another area that could potentially be tackled. Um, so obviously medical waste has to be disposed of appropriately. Getting your medical waste in the right bag um, will make a difference to, to the carbon footprint. So not putting all medical waste in the hazardous bag necessarily um, is, is, is a good start. Um, consideration as to whether there's, there's potential to reuse any equipment. When Polly and I were, were looking at this, we were sort of thinking, could we potentially reuse um, some of the uh, get metal speculum, send them away for sanitization and then reuse them rather than the single use plastic speculums that everyone was using for, for smears and exams and that kind of thing. We never actually managed to get that system in place, but I believe that there are practices in Sheffield that do manage to do that. And I think there's potential for that um, in Derby, so sending them back to the Royal Derby and, and, and getting them back from there. We haven't managed to put anything in place about that. Um, there were some concerns for the nurses in terms of the warmth of the speculum and the fact that they'd have to try and put it in warm water first to make it remotely comfortable, which I, I you know, I definitely see from a, a, a user point of view. Um, but conversations about, you know, what do we need to reuse and what so what has to be single use and what, what can we reuse? Um, certainly there's been some interesting stuff and on the Greener Practice website, they've got loads of information about trials that have been done about things like, you know, how much PPE do you actually need? There's a, a thing done in the Great Ormond Street about, uh, I think it was called Gloves Off, which was a sort of a, an evidence-based trial where they, they try to minimise the medical use, sorry, the use of medical gloves, um, and they significantly reduce the, the single plastic usage as a result. So, yeah, it's that kind of thing. There's there's quite a lot of resources on the, the Greener Practice website. If you're interested in that side of thing, I'd say definitely go and have a look because there's some quite inspiring stuff going on. Um, the potential for recycling, um, that's sort of mainly non medical waste, and we found it tricky in our practice because the guys who are doing our cleaning and waste management were quite limited in what they could do in terms of recycling. We did end up doing some stuff. So, um, you know, we we're doing sort of battery collection and recycling anyway. And then we started using the practice as a bit of a hub for things that are harder to recycle at home. But if one of us made a trip to the tip on the way home once a month, things like silver foil and stuff, everyone in the practice would just bring in the silver foil, dump it in a bag um, and we or a box and we we'd take it. And that worked quite well for, for a bit um, while one or other of us was, was still driving and going to the practice. Um, and then you know, the last point is just consider where, you, where your suppliers are getting things from. Are they traveling halfway across the country? Could you use more local suppliers? Could you pair up with other practices maybe and reduce the supplier journeys and, and mileage and, and, and that sort of thing? Um, so that's all, all quite sort of individualistic in terms of practice by practice basis. There's potential for connections sort of between practices and the PCN. Um, and there's potential certainly for sort of community within the practice to work together. Um, but the, the basic um, added to sort of reduce, reuse, recycle. So then we're on to kind of individual contributions. So this is what we can do as individuals. And staff travel to work is probably the, the biggest thing um, in terms of kind of direct things under each individual person's control. Um, I guess stepping to think about whether or not there's things that the practice could do to make it a bit easier. So, you know, secure bike storage, um, places that you could potentially charge electric vehicles, um, just having a, a shower room so that people could walk or run to work and then and then have a shower. Um, that sort of thing is, is is all worth a thought. We had quite an incident. We we were fully excited about this, Polly and I, and we thought, right, we'll make it a competition. We'll see, we'll award points for, um, well, 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 we'll award minus points for people who drive petrol or diesel vehicles for every mile that they drive. Um, and we'll award bonus points for anyone who's actively traveling to work. And then anyone who's taking the bus or the train um, or using an electric vehicle gets 
zero. And we divided the practice into teams and we had a little cactus as a prize that was going to make its way around the teams, depending on who was winning. Um, and the reality was that people were really, really nice about it, but they didn't have time to think about that or make those decisions or those changes. Um, so that was a really interesting one for us that we thought this is something we can get quite enthusiastic about and we think other people will be. Um, it's just not on everyone's gender. I think having a conversation was, was useful and I do think that more of our staff probably walked work in some of them did do previously. Um, I haven't been able to quantify that, um, but I think just beware of getting too enthusiastic about it or um, anticipating too much enthusiasm uh, in return. Um, I think the, the other the other slight conundrum I have is that um, I got my leg broken cycling to the train station to try and travel to work more greenly. Um, so there's there's pros and cons because my carbon emissions probably went through the roof with my hospital and three surgeries. Um, so I think I think safe active travel to work is, is probably what you're working for there. And, you know, within the realms of, of what each individual could, could potentially do. Um, the other sort of thought on, on, on those individual contributions is um, looking at, um, you know, your communal snacks and treats, um, carbon emissions of kind of wrappers and stuff isn't going to make that big a difference um, and it's not like people tend to leave kind of massive amounts of meat or dairy around the the room but if you're looking at sort of promoting active lifestyles and 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 the sort of the the greener choices in general sort of slightly away from carbon emissions um having a think about what what you have in your staff room might be might be worth the thought um but again some days you just need biscuits um I think the final point is probably the, the main point of the whole presentation, to be honest, which is if you fancy thinking about what you could do to, to make your practice a little bit greener, um, there are things going on in the background, there are national agendas in place. Um, but I think that the main thing would be to, to have a little think about it, maybe have a conversation with, with the partners and then pick something that, that you feel might work for you and and see where you get to um because not not all roads are plain sailing um but if some things work that's better than it was before um which is a, a definite win the the other thing with individual contributions if you're interested in this kind of thing there's a, a book guide by a chap called mike berners lee called how bad are bananas and it's brilliant in terms of just setting out the carbon footprint of everything so from you know, a banana, all the way to, um, you know, flying to New Zealand. And it gives you an idea of, of the order of magnitude of your carbon emission for those choices. And there's some some really interesting things in there that I wouldn't have thought of. Um, so like crocs are the most carbon neutral, neutral shoe choice, um, which I, I wouldn't have thought in a million years. Um, and it, it's just from an individual, what could I be doing point of view? it's worth a read. So again, there's there's no financial incentive for me to say that, but um, it's, it's quite cool. Um, the other thought in terms of less necessarily about carbon emissions per se, but sort of what Gail was saying earlier about promoting more active lifestyles, sort of greener health, non-medication based health and wellbeing options. Um, there is quite a big part of greener practice that is sort of based on the typical GP role of being a, a pillar of the community or, or what we used to be and the influence that we have as, as example setters and as potential kind of hubs for places to run and things to be done. Um, and so these are kind of a, a few ideas and the sheep are just because sheep are quite good at being a part of a community. Um, so, you know, things like linked with local authorities, particularly about travel and transport um, and around sort of heating and fuel social services um, fuel poverty is certainly something that's, that's come up quite a lot in our practice this year. And, and we've had a lot more consultations as a direct result of people really struggling with their, their heating and fuel, be it mental health or, or physical health, um, with particularly with respiratory illnesses. Um, and I've no doubt that there's been an impact in the, the hospital admissions for that as well. So if there's fuel poverty support schemes locally 
it's worth if we can knowing about them or making sure that our care coordinators know about them and, and can sort of signpost people towards them. Um, similarly, links with schools, so things like period poverty, education, about sort of self-care, um, health expectations, that kind of thing. Um, you know, midwifery services, reusable, washable nappies. Um, I mean, I think anyone who manages to keep a baby alive is doing pretty well, to be honest. I can just about keep the cat alive. Um, but if they have the capacity to then do reusable nappies as well, that's that's brilliant. Um, and then the, a final kind of plug for the Greener Practice Network, which I'll put the link for the website um, on the end. And they have um, local groups, if you're interested in this kind of thing that you can join. They've got special interest groups and they've got a trainee forum as well. Um, and they are sort of growing year on year. So when I first came across them a couple of years ago, um, they were reasonably small based around two or three practices in Sheffield and they've now expanded quite a lot. Um, Yes, brilliant, thank you. So our next session is going to be with um, Shella. I don't know if you remember her, she came to speak to us um, previously about partnership. So our next session is on March the 15th, and that is at Make Me Hall. We're going to see each other face to face, everyone, so it's very, very exciting. Um, so look forward to seeing you all there. We will be sending out some information about um, food, so yes, we can get more excited about that too. So look forward to seeing you. The other little bits and bobs are just about extra education. So um, I do this, but I also do the Derbyshire Education Network. So I know someone had put, they'd like some more information about CAMS and I'm trying to organize a CAMS session on the DEN side. So if you put on your feedback something that I can't quite fit into new to practice, I'll always try and do it on DEN for you as well. So um, yeah, we're doing the uh, tinnitus pathway um, audiology services one on the 8th of March and then um, a friend that I work with at school happens to be a paediatric dietitian, so that was useful. And she's going to come and do an infant feeding difficulties talk for us, so that should be really good. Sasha's really lovely. So do look out for those ones. And they are also advertised on the Facebook group for Derbyshire First 5GP, so join that if you haven't, because it, we it also um, keeps up to date with the Nottingham First 5, because we've got good links with them. So if you join that Facebook group, you'll be able to kind of keep up to date with all those bits and we also put on there ones that aren't first five you know ones that um like the spire do or the nuffield now i don't know there was a few tickets last time i spoke to james who's been helping organize this conference and i'm not sure right in this moment if there's any left but this should be really good